Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the European Comics and the Absurd panel. My name is Bill Cardalopoulos. I'm moderating today. I'm the series editor for the Best American Comics series published by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. Uh, but I'm here today with three of the best European cartoonists. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll talk about all of their work uh, in a little bit. Suffice it to say that uh, all three of these authors um, are excellent. Their work is all very humorous. Uh, it's uh, somehow, I think, transcends international boundaries. Uh, and in fact, all three of them have been published now here in North America. Uh, Brecht Vandenbroek has the book White Cube, uh, currently out from Drawn and Quarterly. Bendik Kaltenborn has uh, uh, adult Contemporary, also just published by Drawn and Quarterly. Uh, Joan Cornella has the book uh, Mox Knox, which is not the one that he's holding, uh, out from Fantagraphics, as well as a uh, self-published sequel, also available here this weekend. Uh, we'll talk about all these books and more, uh, but for the moment, please join me in welcoming these artists here to SPX today. Um, Bendik Brecht and, and John, I think, all have a lot of uh, affinities as, as artists while also being quite different. Um, but I think their shared enthusiasm for one another's work is probably uh, best manifest in this wonderful image that I just wanted to share with you in case you hadn't seen it. This is the image that Brecht, uh, who's all the way to uh, the left, my left of the table, your right, uh, drew, uh, speculating on what today's panel event might be like here at SPX. Um, and... Uh, Looks bad for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know, Brecht. Why did you decide that you and Joan would probably um, want to destroy Bendix? <laughs> I mean, we planned for him to sit in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If I could reach Joan, I would. Yeah, it's too far. <clears throat> is Brecht's microphone working? Can you hear him? No. Is Testing. Who's doing the sound? Test, test, test. Test, yes. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. So, so no one heard that you're about your, you're about your plan to murder Bendik in a minute. Okay, so um, I'd like to talk to each of you a little bit about uh, your individual books and your individual bodies of work, and then we can talk about uh, some of the broader um, connections. Um, uh, Brecht, your book White Cube came out, uh, I guess, a little over a year ago now in the US, right? Yes. Yep. Um, but it had been out first in, I think the first edition was the Belgian edition yeah, by Breeze. Yeah, Breeze, yeah. yeah. Um, how many of you have read this book or seen it? A few of you. Um, it's a really beautiful book. Uh, the, I think White Cube, uh, well, what does the title refer to for those who aren't? Uh, aren't yeah, it's about those? the art world. So it's, uh, it's, it follows two characters on a journey to um, the world of aesthetics and uh, they go into a museum and uh, just, it's also about criticism. Mm -hmm. So they kind of react to the work they see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in White Cube is kind of, you know, for those of you who aren't familiar with the, the sort of slang term, it sort of refers to the very typical gallery, right, which is just the kind of empty white walls of the gallery into which uh, 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 various art goes. Um, and, you know, what I love about this book is that it's a comic that criticizes art in a way, but it also has so many artful qualities. It's this beautiful silent painted work, and I think that's summed up very nicely uh, in this image here, where we have the characters in a bookshop, and they see that one side is for art and the other is for comics, and they resolve this um, tension by breaking a hole uh, through the wall, kind of Looney Tunes style. Um, this other image also, I think, uh, represents a really funny uh, slapstick take uh, on the art world. Can you all see the screen okay from where you're sitting? Yes, yeah. super. Um, and, and so forth. Um, I'm wondering uh, if in some ways this um, dynamic between art and comics that's represented in this comic here was a dynamic for you or a tension for you. Did you feel like you had to make a choice at some point between being a fine artist and a comics artist? Uh, yeah, definitely. You know, I, I drew a lot of comics when I was a child and then I did art school and then they told me that, you know, comics are not art and stuff like that. So with this book, this is actually the last page of the entire book and mm -hmm. it's kind of closing. He has to choose between arts or comics and he decides not to choose, but just to crash in between. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the setup for me also. Mm -hmm. Where did you go to school? I went to Ghent uh, uh -huh. in St. Lucas, mm -hmm. yeah. And you were there, I think, um, at the same time as uh, Brecht Devins, yes. uh, who's been to the US many times and has yeah. been translated here. Yeah, he's also published by John and Quarterly, and we were uh, in the class together. Mm -hmm. 
Was that, I'm just kind of curious, was that um, uh, something that you shared, that question of what am I doing with my art? Is it comics and fine art? Is this something that I have to choose between and so forth? I mean, yeah, I, for me it was never like a choice in that sense. I just make what I want to see mm -hmm. and I just make what I'm, I, I can do. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to, you know, for me it's not the question if it's art or not. It's mm -hmm. just what it is, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh. um, one of the things that's uh, really striking about this work, of course, is the, um, the, the fact that these are painted comics. Yeah, all um, the pages in the book are original painted works, mm -hmm. yeah. What materials do you use? Uh, acrylics uh -huh. on paper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how did you arrive at this way of working where the comics were wordless and painted? Those are two very specific choices, I think. Yeah, I, I wanted to make a, a silent comic. I wanted it to be very visual, just r because it talks about aesthetics. So the choice was very quickly made to not have any dialogues. So you just have to take time to look at the images and the drawing and the lines, for example, in this one. Um, this one is not even like, it's not really a joke, it's just about the movement and trying to make a comic where the dance and the movement is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it was also kind of like an, a little exercise for myself. Mm -hmm. um, as we've seen already, the, um, uh, the, the comic can be very critical to art, uh, so it, and it's very funny to see these characters behaving badly in a museum setting and behaving badly in yeah. the art. They're very, they're not nice characters. That's very important to right. point out. They're very um, sadistic and very mean. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, yeah, they would not be my friends. Right. And yeah, so we see them also out in society sometimes and they're very, they're very cruel to the people around them. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you feel like you maybe share their attitudes towards art, but wouldn't want to see those attitudes applied to society? Is there some uh, element of liking with them sometimes and disliking them other times? I mean, yeah, I guess so. It's it's a weird thing. Um, I I don't always agree with everything they they think. I would say mm -hmm. definitely. They're, it's it's a satire. It's more uh, you know they're mean spirited, very mean spirited. Mm -hmm. How did you come up with these two pink, identical-looking characters? Well, the idea was, you know, we live in an age of criticism, and I was just, I mean, this was Facebook and that whole thing. I was uh, a lot on Facebook at this period because I made this, I think, three years ago, four years ago, and uh, it was there's a lot of the thumbs up in this book, and it was about criticism, so I made two characters that look exactly like each other in the sense they have both have an opinion, but the opinion is the same... Uh, <laughs> And so it's kind of a pointless opinion because it's twice the same character. It's just like they talk to themselves. It's like a mirror thing. Right, right. Yeah. So yeah, it's, they're, they're an echo of one another. Yeah, they're an echo. And that's exactly that's what so happens good. on the internet often. It becomes this echo chamber. Yeah. And I yeah. think often criticism gets subsumed to participation right. in a community. Right. Um, and that then ends up forming standardized opinions about things. Yeah, I mean, that was the idea, and then, of course, I, I made jokes with that idea mm -hmm. in, in the back in my head. Mm -hmm. you, do, um, you do a lot of other kinds of art, and as you say, you know, a lot of this work at this point must be close to three years old, and you've been... Yeah. Is that yeah. about right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's you've been doing a lot of other things since then. I do a lot of illustration work. Mm -hmm. uh, I make comics for magazines. I, I do exhibitions. I paint also. Yeah. Uh, I feel like um, you know, with with the with the white cube characters, uh, you know, you you kind of enjoy indulging the things that they do sometimes, even if it's not something that you have sympathy with yourself. But in some of the single images you've been posting online, and these are some recent ones, I feel like it becomes very clear that you have like a very kind of moral or critical point of view that's yeah. specifically your own that comes through more in these images. I, I try to make modern work. That's kind of, I, that's the idea in my back. I want to make work that's about the way humans are today. Mm -hmm. So this one is called Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Wall? And it was just about um, the ideas of walls and limits. And so I just, it's like a collage. These paintings, I make them kind of as a, a mood board. Before I do comics, it's it's just a collage of images where I'm interested in, and I try to put them up into each uh, against each other in one image. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. No, it's so fascinating, and especially like the the um, uh, you know the the kind of happy face on the sort of authoritarian things that happen in the background and the, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it's just about the, the confusing world we live in. It's, it's, you know, you have to have the bad and the good in one image. I like to have the tension between something that looks happy but it's very dark. Mm -hmm. I think uh, emotions are very close to each other. Something that's very scary uh, is also very funny, I think. Mm -hmm. the, for me, emotions are very close to each other, so I like to have both mm -hmm. in one image. Yeah, that is, that is such a great point, and I think that's so close to um, a lot of the work that all three of you do, this idea that the things that we're afraid of are also entertaining somehow, or the things that are offensive are also entertaining, and maybe even enlightening and profound, too, uh, mm -hmm. or they can be. One thing I wanted to ask you, like, um, uh, you know, I think, I think one of the reasons your work has traveled so well, and I think this is true of Joanne also, is that for two reasons. One, it's wordless. Well, actually, three reasons. One, it's wordless. Two, it's great. Wordless and in the sense of no words. No words. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And two, it's, you know, it's very good. But also three, there's an internet now. Yeah. And I think you were saying that you were spending a lot of time on Facebook before. And on the one hand, with like a lot of the images that you do, it's kind of a critique of that culture. It's also, you know, there's a sense that like uh, of surveillance culture and the various aspects that mm -hmm. connect to also social media there. Um, and yet it's also been, I think, probably an important way for you to both get your work out there and discover work by other people and so on. Do you have any feelings about participation in social media and, and networked media? I mean, it's been great. Uh, I also do a lot of uh, illustration work, of course, and I, I'm so glad I never had to walk around with big folders and knock on people's doors. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, the work kind of makes its own way, and if people want to spread it, it will spread itself. If it doesn't, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't. It's kind of, it's interesting to see, you know. I, it's also weird, like some work will be more popular than other. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's it's interesting. I don't know what to think of it. Of course, it's all a consequence. You make the work, and then once you put it out there, it leads its own life. Mm -hmm. um, this is another one that you posted, you know, relatively recently that I like very much. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I yeah. liked. I liked the, t the. I don't know if this is the official title, but this was the caption on maybe. Yeah, on your blog. yeah. I put it on there. Yeah. Do you think <laughs> you know? This goes back to what you were saying about uh, liking culture on Facebook. Do you think that people, the artists, are maybe too solicitous of online audiences in the sense like trying to get those likes, trying to attract the audience, trying to be popular? Or I mean, we're all part of it, uh, I guess, but. Uh, it, you know, it's always been like that also, I think. Now it's just visual, because we see it. We see it if someone likes you. Before, you just couldn't tell. Um, so that has changed. Yeah. Um, and you've been posting a bunch of other work with different characters recently that I assume and very much hope will be collected into new books. Right. Uh, the most recent ones have been this character, Shady Bitch. Yeah. And uh, you've been including text in these comics. Right, that's new for me. Yeah. yeah, I was wondering if you could talk both about what this character is and also working with dialogue and text for the first time. Um, this is uh, yeah something I'm working on right now. It's actually for a magazine in France, and I make a comic every two weeks. It, 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 the magazine appears every two weeks, so it's mm -hmm. quite a, a cool concept. What's the name of the magazine? Uh, Société. Mm -hmm. And uh, they asked me to make a comic, and I was very happy to do it. I wanted to make kind of a, a classic, just a one-page uh, it's kind of a, it's a joke uh, page, but I wanted the character to be kind of in between male and female, mm -hmm. and just to have classic jokes. So that's not the joke that is male or female. It's just he has adventures and and things happen to him and yeah. Is do you um do you publish these in English in the French magazine or do they? Yeah, hear? actually they do. I'm very I I write in English. I don't know. I don't think my English is always so good, but I'm I. I, I post these online also, and it doesn't make sense to post them in Dutch because people that are interested in in Dutch comics, it's a small group. So, and I want to be, I want to be, I want to make my work more democratic, mm -hmm. and so can that people can read it. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, and Joan, I know your work has also been seen uh, quite a bit on social media. Uh, your your first book, uh, Mox Knox, as we said, is now available from Fanographics, and you also have the sequel that you self-published in Spain uh, with you. Um, and uh, 
the work has a very different set of interests and, and a very different style than Brecht's, but I think it shares, <laughs> it, it shares the quality, I think, of, of having a, a feeling of being universal because it has no text and because it's been so available online. How did you develop uh, this style of working with paint and without any text? Um, I started doing this kind of comics uh, when I saw Brecht work, and I I decided to, to paint my own work. Mm -hmm. and before that, I used to, no, that's true. <laughs> um, what was your background before, before I, I that? Were you uh, making comics already before this? Sorry? Were you making comics already before this work? Mm, yeah, I, I, I did a lot of, of comics with uh, text and, uh, and so different. It, it was kind of the opposite. I think it was so so um, influenced by, by Cram and Klaus and this kind of comics. And, and then I decided to, to just um, um, destroy this, this this early stuff, and and I big, I started doing this like <laughs> word with no words, mm -hmm. trying to <laughs> have more audience, have more public, and posting all my stuff in, on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and I think I I think I, I have a, a lot of they have a lot of influence of of Brecht's work and also Erzele, mm -hmm. but I think. This is more about um, death, and I don't know, I think it's more about a joke, making jokes. I think Brecht works is, is, is more about, um, it's, it's more serious, maybe it's more polit uh, about politics, and mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I think there's a big difference, certainly, in the thematic uh, interests, um, even beyond all of the aesthetic differences. Um, even like in a strip like this, where it's sort of a joke about pop culture, I think, like you said, it's it's really <laughs> it's really more of a joke, really about life and death and human passion and desires and just yep. the kind of embarrassment of being a human animal and the illusion that we're not just a skin full of meat and blood and things like that somehow. Yeah. Mm. Yes, something like that. I, I think <laughs> <laughs> I like the way you say it. So. <laughs> um, that sounds great. Yeah. Well, I mean, you have other um, influences too, of course. Um, but that is interesting to see that uh, you were, even though you're so close in age and your work appeared so close together, that you were influenced uh, by Brecht uh, to some extent. Um, uh, we're, and it, what's interesting to me, too, is that you mentioned that your other influences had been people like Crum and Dan Klaus and things like that. Did you have an easy time finding those kinds of American comics in Spain? Um, no, I, grew, I grew up with this kind of comic, so I, it was quite easy to... Mm -hmm. to it was all translated, so I mm -hmm. think most of the different graphic stuff was mm -hmm. translated at that time, I mean, the 90s. Mm -hmm. And I think it was like my, I, I, I grew up with this kind of comics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, there, there's one comic that you did, I think, you know, you said that your work isn't as involved with politics as so much as, um, as Brecht's is, but I actually, uh, even though the imagery is very startling in this one, I actually found this to be a very strong political comic. I mean, this is like, this y resonates quite a bit with a lot of horrible things that happen in the United States, uh, like every 90 days, it seems. Uh, do you, I mean, are you... Yeah, but uh, when, I did the, when I did this comics, um, I still doing, I, I'm still doing these comics, but I mean, when I did this um, specific, it's, it's, it's not, it wasn't, I, w I wasn't aware that it, ha it has a, a uh, huge political charge. It, it mm -hmm. I mean, I, I was interested in just making a joke and mm, make people laugh, and that's all. But then, when what makes what makes me laugh? It's uh, it's always about this kind of dark um, humor and this dark um, um, meaning. So it's and 
most most of most of times it's, it's about it's related to political things but um it's not a it's not that i i wanted to i wanted to be this like the i i don't have a political agenda but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it's yeah. Um, but you know the, what's what's fascinating is that um, the work has been so uh, uh, popular online. This is, I mean, this is your Facebook page. You have two and a half million people following your work on the internet, and I wonder if there is a relationship between the fact that the work can be transgressive; it sort of breaks taboos, and therefore it becomes more international because it becomes more human because the things that we think of as being taboo are often things that are, whether we like them or not, very deeply fundamental to the human experience, like hate and death and violence and injury. Um, how, what has your experience been putting the work online? Has it, have you gotten good response uh, beyond the obvious Facebook likes? Do people communicate with you about this work? Mm. I have to say my, my mom's so proud about this <laughs> 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 Um but I, I don't think it's so important. I mean, to me, it's, it's more. I wanted to be. You all, as an artist, you want to be to have a lot of feedback, and 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 on Facebook, it's so easy to have uh, an everyday feedback. But um, I don't know. It's it's like um, I'm trying to to achieve, uh, have more audience, but at the same time. Uh, I don't like the mainstream thing that you have on, on always on the media, yeah. and I, I'm start. I think I'm. I feel myself like I'm starting to to be uh, some kind of uh, mainstream <laughs> thing because it, I, I have a lot of audience now. So, I w it, and it was a, sur a surprise to me when I was starting this comic. So, in I started this Facebook page on two years ago, or three three years ago. So, I think it's. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's all. It's a lot. Yeah. It's, um, it's a surprise to me. So, yeah. well, one of the things that's interesting to me too is that um, I feel like um, we 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 experience so much media digitally, and this applies, I think, to your work too, Breck. We experience all this media digitally, and everything is very flat, you know, and everything is made out of like pure color, and it's light mm -hmm. sh shining out at us. And more and more people are using Cintiq or Wacom tablets to draw. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but you know, it does have an aesthetic influence on the world around us. And yet, at the same time, um, the internet is very good at showing handmade work. If you scan something in and put it on the internet, sometimes it looks better than it looks in the printed book, right? Like, yeah. Or it looks closer yeah. to the original yeah. than the printed book. And I think maybe in both of your cases, part of the appeal of the work is that the texture of it mm. feels very made by hand. Mm. And your eye, I think, slows down to look at yeah. those subtle variations. I don't know, do you agree with that? Yeah, I definitely agree. Also, if I look at this work, it's, it's just, I mean, it's a good joke, but it's also just nice to look at. It's, it's mm -hmm. also, I don't know. You, you, yeah, it definitely transcends. I always see it when I also scan my works. The colors are brighter on a screen, mm -hmm. like when the printed, you know, especially when you paint, a lot of colors get sucked down. Mm -hmm. So I think also this his work also works very well on screens and on internet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's counterintuitive somehow, and yet uh, I think there's been a flourishing of very handmade-looking comics online. People working with collage or gouache or ink wash or yeah, you know. Uh, I think there's just I mean a lot of freedom like we can we're no i think people are not really restricted anymore mm -hmm. i mean there's computers but all these old techniques are also still there mm -hmm. and we can still use them mm -hmm. so. yeah. we were talking earlier before about before the panel about influences and john you mentioned bunuel uh, as an influence among others among, including some of the cartoonists we've talked about here do you see your work as being connected to a tradition of surrealism um, yeah, it is, but it w uh, I think it will be pretentious to, to, to say that Bunuel is my, my most uh, important mm -hmm. uh, influence. Mm -hmm. I think there is uh, these trashy, shitty photo uh, pictures in, on the internet that could be more 
impressive to me, more, it, it could be more uh, an influence, a real influence. But then, I, of course, Buñuel is like my one of my favorite filmmakers. But I think, yeah, th there's a tradition of, 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 sur of surrealism, and, and I think I, I would like to be part of it. <laughs> it's more than it's more like this. Yeah, yeah, sure. Than I don't know. It, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Um, so, uh, Bendik, you've been to SPX before. Yes, I was there like uh, ten years ago, I think. Okay. Or and and you did, but you didn't come by yourself, as as I recall. No, this is uh, who I uh, came with, yeah. and this is a normal day at the office in Oslo. Uh huh. Uh, it's actually uh, uh, my kitchen or our kitchen at uh, our studio, mm -hmm. making fun scenes, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. Yeah. Does anyone has anyone here? Um, does anyone have a memory of the Dongari group being at SPX? A couple oh. of you, yeah. <laughs> no. Um, yeah. This is uh, a picture of the Dongari group. I always yeah, thought the Dongari group was so interesting because we see pictures of you in Oslo, and you look like um, you know you've you're you're all corporate executives uh, making uh, fanzines and mini comics. Uh, but when you guys would come to SPX, you'd come as like this uh, insane Norwegian gang in matching <laughs> t-shirts. <laughs> yeah, but this is 10 years ago. But we, uh, the, the trip to SPX was uh, super important to us because we, we just, I don't remember why we went there, but we just went there and we, we made some fan scenes in English. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, we uh, we sold out. I guess maybe because we all were having these uh, yellow T-shirts and like <laughs> looking really crazy together, and came all the way from Norway, and and we got really um, uh, excited. So we started going back, and we've been going to uh, lots of festivals around the world uh, after that. So it's become a really important part of uh, my career, just to go around and meet people at festivals. Uh, and there's also like the image of Dongri, there's like th that tension continues in the material too, because on the one hand, like the comics and zines always have this very kind of loose and spontaneous and casual feeling with classic titles like Dressed to Piss. Um, and, um, but at the same time, your latest book that I've seen is this deluxe uh, two volume hardcover boxed set. Um, yeah, it's it's really, uh, it's really stupid. It's the most stupid project we actually ever done because it's <laughs> we, we we've been producing fan scenes since uh, '97 and it's over 100. I don't know many how many fan scenes, but there's a lot. And for some reason, we figured out we wanted to collect everything, like everything we done, and we scanned everything and we made a commentary track underneath uh, each page. For I don't know who would be interested in reading that, but we've. It's a really ego uh, box, and it's two volumes, one book with all the Norwegian stuff and one book with all the English stuff, and it's not uh, the same, it's not translated, so it's different stuff, and it's, I, I can still can't believe that we actually uh, did this, it's so, <laughs> it's really stupid, but, but it's done, yeah, we did it. Um, and everyone in Dongri has their solo work, work that they do by themselves independently, but then there's the work that the group makes together. How would you characterize like the the spirit or aesthetic of of the Dongari work? I think it's just very. Uh, for us, it's all about just uh, having a good time. We're meeting together and we just uh, make drawings and pass them around and just make stuff that we want to uh, to do and to read. And the reason we started it in '97 uh, was because the Norwegian comic scene was kind of. Uh, we felt it was really a bit boring. Uh, it was a lot of, in Norway, like comics, newspaper strips is the big thing. Uh, so we just wanted to make something different that we wanted to read ourselves, maybe. Yeah. So it's again, it's a really an ego project. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the, the, the work always has this feeling of uh, spontaneity. Uh, and it's interesting looking at your um, solo work. This is your first English language collection of comics that you made by yourself. Although I think it's the second one in Europe. Is that true? Uh, that's true, yes. Yeah. Um, and the work has this nice balance, because we'll look at some of your illustration work in a minute, which is very refined looking. Um, the work has this kind of nice balance between refinement and um, spontaneity. I, I, the, do you have notes in the back of the book, and you describe the creation of a lot of the comics, and it sounds like many of them were improvised. Is that true? Yeah, that's very true. That's, that's how I work all the time. I improvise, and um, if I plan too much ahead, it doesn't... Uh doesn't work for me. So uh, 
I still keep the the dongery, the loose spirit when I do uh, comics and uh, illustrations and whatever I do. It's the improvisation and the the gut feeling is like the most important mm -hmm. uh, fuel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and some of them, like the one we just saw, you know, have have a nice, uh, you know, full color look. Some of them were unpublished comic strip that you just drew for your pleasure in your sketchbook. Yeah, I think probably at least half of the work in there was previously unpublished. Yeah, I right? think so. I think there's a lot of stuff that just when I sit on the train or uh, on my cab, uh, not cabbage, uh, ca cabin in the mountain. Yeah, in your cabbage. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I draw just stuff in the sketchbook and. Uh, when I collect this, all this stuff for this book, it's like uh, stuff I've been doing for the last uh, five years. I, I like to have this variety of uh, the more uh, thoroughly, uh, thorough drawn stuff and the very loose stuff mm -hmm. to get the, the whole specter. Mm -hmm. This is one that you know, has, a, has a tighter uh, and more specific kind of drawing style. Um, I, I have one example of this strip, but can you describe what this one was? Because I thought this was a very funny sequence in the book. Uh, this was, uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in Norway, this, this newspaper strip is huge. I mean, some uh, some of the Norwegian comic artists uh, who make strips, they are many multi-millionaires making strips. And it's, uh, you get kind of tired of the, like, if you talk about comics or say you're doing comics, people say, oh, so which strip do we have in which paper? And So I just decided to do uh, my own strip, and it was just my own project. I didn't have any plan to publish it. It was for a small exhibition. But at the same time, I was asked by one of the biggest paper in Norway if I was interested in doing a strip. So I said, yes, I actually have a strip here. And it was just a completely stupid strip, not meant for uh, for being in the paper. Mm -hmm. um, and, then it was, and it turned out to be a kind of interesting experiment because uh, when it was published, uh, people got really pissed. And I, I kept, for this book, I gathered the strips and I also unedited it. I kept all the, the commentaries. From the from the newspaper site, and people got really angry. And it, not because it was provocative, maybe, but just it was so stupid that people got angry and they didn't understand it. And what the heck is this? <laughs> and it was really interesting to follow the follow the the aggression on the online. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this is just it's a I mean, the book itself. It's maybe about 200 pages long, but it's got probably almost 80 or something different pieces in it because many of them are very short. Um, and it's it's a real variety. Like this one. What, can you talk about the creation of this one? I'm sorry? What was the oh, circumstances of this? Uh, me and uh, another friend from Dongri, Christopher Schoenberg, we were sitting in a bar in New York and uh, drinking beers, and we just made this on a napkin. Uh, <laughs> just passed it back and forth. Um, and again, it's that's we just have a good time doing it, and yeah. sometimes you can put it in the book. And yeah, and, and on, you know, on one page you might have a, a comic like this that was literally drawn on a napkin, and then on another page you might have something like this that's a, a poster <laughs> that you drew for an exhibit. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's uh, you know a very very refined image, but also uh, one of the things that I love about something like this is this looks a lot like your illustration work. I suspect you're not lucky enough to have many clients who would ask you for an image quite like this one. <laughs> Maybe not that like that, but yeah. yeah. Um, but you do a lot of illustration, and I see a lot of it actually in New York. I think the New York Times and the New Yorker are probably two places I've seen uh, a lot of your stuff. This is pretty recent, right? Yeah, this, this is from this summer. Yeah, uh, this it was really fun. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that uh, even though the previous, uh, like the push-up guy, is kind of uh, crazy, mm -hmm. I'm really happy to when I work with the New Yorker, for instance. They, in the beginning, I was trying to make kind of clean and a bit safe drawings, but mm -hmm. I realized that what they really wanted is. They've seen some of my stuff online, and uh, they ask. Sometimes they they ask me to do it more and more crazy, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. which I love to do. So uh, a lot of times I I'm I'm allowed to do, to like really go bonkers uh, uh, in a way I enjoy. Mm -hmm. um, you did a piece that was very visible because it was the um, illustration for the first piece in the New Yorker by Lena Dunham, who's the creator and star of the series Girls, and has other projects. Um, you had mentioned that, uh, well, actually, this piece, the, the text principally got some negative attention because there was some concern that by making this joke of a fake quiz that was my dog or my Jewish boyfriend, you know, I don't remember the actual jokes. It's just a lot of statements that uh, you should choose if it was uh, her dog or her Jewish boyfriend. It was mm -hmm. like, yeah, that was the whole piece. Yeah. And, and even your, uh, your illustration was questioned but you didn't even um, draw anything that looked remotely like an er ethnic stereotype, I don't think, right? No, I mean, the, I think the, at first the, the text was the whole issue. 
and at some point I got a call uh, from Slate magazine, uh, and in Norwegian time it was a Friday night, and I had a couple of beers, <laughs> uh, not that many, but uh, I, sh I learned an important lesson that day because I, I s accepted the interview and I asked what is this about, and it was like uh, it seemed okay, and uh, I tried to answer uh, as best as I could, and. It turned out that when it was posted, uh, printed just uh, right after we uh, ended the conversation, it was online, um, and she had uh, altered it a lot, and she also misquoted me, because in this drawing, in the first sketch, I drew uh, Le Lena Dunham's uh, actual boyfriend, which I don't remember the name of right now, but since it's about her dog and her specific boyfriend, I was thought that was a good idea, but they asked me just to change it to like a, like a person, not, not, a, not a specific person. And somehow she... Uh, misquoted me and said like, so they asked asked you to, to draw a generic Jew uh, yeah. character. Mm -hmm. And I was really, uh, and it was like spread around that the Hollywood reporter and like uh, the Dunham illustrator speaks his mind and it was a misquote, it was really a horrible uh, situation. Yeah. That's terrible. Um, I mean, but many many of your other illustration experiences have hopefully been less uh, fraught. This is, uh, for, I, I brought in a local example. I think this is, um, I didn't put the label on. Is this the Washington Post, I think? Yes. Um, so that's the local newspaper here. And you do a lot, of course, in, in Europe, too. Are you the regular cover artist for Psychology? Yeah, I've been for a year. I've been the regular artist for the cover of the Psychology, mm -hmm. the, yeah, this magazine. <laughs> and mm -hmm. it's, uh, I really enjoy working with them because usually I get these quirky, crazy uh, commissions. But uh, in these magazines, I have to, to deal with like uh, domestic violence and really heavy stuff, mm -hmm. which I have to handle with differently than a lot of other uh, like shots and murmurs mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's very healthy for me to do these kind of things as yeah. well is there do you feel like there's a difference between your comics and your illustration work do you feel like the comics are a place where you don't have to please someone perhaps yeah definitely I I do but at the same time I feel that even though my illustration work is uh, is sometimes very clean. I keep some of the crazy, like the dongri silliness mm -hmm. in it mm -hmm. somehow, in spirit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But comics is like uh, what I do in a in the cabbage, <laughs> on my <laughs> in the mountain, in the cabbage, uh, in the the cabbage. cabbage. no, uh, yeah. <laughs> on my my own personal project. Yeah. yeah. And Brecht, you do a lot of illustration too. I see your work quite a bit. Um, the New York Times, uh, in particular, I think I've seen noticed your work a couple times. This is for the cover of an issue of the Sunday Review, and that's a. a a larger uh, image of that. Um, this is from the MIT uh, Technology Review, an article about Google, uh, and, and another fairly recent one from the New York Times. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about the difference between working for an art director and working for yourself? Um, I mean, I like it um, because it pushes me in, in other directions. I have to draw stuff I normally don't draw mm -hmm. a lot of the times, mm -hmm. uh, but it also it definitely also influenced my my own work and my own comics, mm -hmm. um, in in just in the subjects that I have to draw a lot of the times. Mm -hmm. So I will make sketches before, and then I'll have like a lot of sketches that I don't use, and then sometimes I'll use them in my free work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, yeah, I mean for me there's not a lot of difference. Of course, comics are different in the sense that you have a transition in time, mm -hmm. and it's a different way of storytelling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, John, I actually, I don't think I've seen any work of yours other than the work uh, that's in those two books. Do you do this kind of work also, illustration or anything like that? Well, I never do, but mm -hmm. um, I did it like twice maybe. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, did, I did some illustrations for the New York Times. But uh, I don't. One one was published. The other one was totally a, a mess. I, they <laughs> they didn't like m what I sent, and and I think it's because I, I I'm not good at it. I'm not. I don't know how how can I um, um, do a, uh, transform ideas from others to good illustration. So I'm. And I prefer to to do my own stuff. I, I mean, uh, to me, it's like it's more like that that I want to uh, to I want to do my my own ideas and every every time uh, I can. It's obvious. It's um, most of m most of people can can do that. I mean, if you are in, uh, an illustrator, uh, you have to you you have to deal with that. You have to. 
work for others and and you are also you you are always i'm i'm always working for others i mean i have an, a public to to <laughs> so it's no i think it's true it's i think it's like you have you have your work but your 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 own work your personal work but you have to deal with with some um public so it's not your own stuff it's 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 always uh, a fight um, when we were talking about uh, influences earlier, one name that came up uh, from a bunch of you was uh, Herzela, who's the artist of the Cowboy Hank strips that are co-written with by another artist named Kamagurka. Has anyone seen Cowboy Hank before? They're, they were in. We know them a little bit in the U.S. because they were in Raw magazine, although those are out of print now too. Um, but Fremok has been here to SPX and other American festivals, and they've brought Cowboy Hank books, and it's been in a few other publications. So we know him a little bit. But he's a, uh, how would you describe him? You're, you're Flemish, you can, you can Yeah, you he's, he's from Belgium. Um, <laughs> you know, Herzila does the artwork, and then Kamakurka mostly wrote kind uh -huh. of the, the, the scripts. Um, they're both very famous in Belgium. Um, Kamakurka is, is known for a lot of stuff. He wrote for television, he made theater, children's books, everything. Mm -hmm. But mostly it's always humorous and it's always very surreal and absurd. And they definitely work in the tradition of Magritte. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's, it's Belgian surrealism. It's like a very, very thing on, of its own. There's also not, I mean, there's a lot of people that follow their footsteps, but I, I think they're still so strong. Like their work is still, I don't know. It's it's quite unique, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, had you seen this work, Bendik, when you started making comics? I, I uh, I've absolutely seen it and I love it, but I haven't uh, I haven't known it for a long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's published in Norway by the same publisher uh, as me. Oh, okay. The book. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. um, very recently, there was a festival in uh, Aix en Provence in France. And there was a pretty special project where Herzela um, and Brecht and Joan uh, collaborated on a mural, right? Yeah. Um, we I painted think together. <laughs> yeah. We painted together. Yeah. What was that? What was that like? It was good, but <laughs> I have to say um, he has a very strong personality. I mean Herzela, mm -hmm. he, and he's like an old master, um, and. He, 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 we were like something like we were the students. Yeah, or yeah. slaves. You can say slaves, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but it was so it, it was so fun. Yeah, but it was but um, but but. Uh, I think there were some difficulties in the sense also it's it's big. Like it was a very very big painting, and we had to get all three of our stuff on it. Mm -hmm. So we made some sketches before mm -hmm. we came together and and drew together, which was. Kind of fun, but then was we this, was this the central image? I couldn't find an image of the complete thing. Yeah, was this part of it? Uh, no, no, no. This no, is I, I made this as an announcement. Oh, okay. But it so could be this. better to do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think the central image looks like maybe it's the one that's based on Lao Kaon. Is that true? Yeah. The guy wrestling with the snake. There was a lot of uh, cultural references and 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 things in it, and also our own portraits were also in it, and. Uh, yeah, he's such a good painter, by the way. Herzila, he's so talented. Like, I mean, he just paints these things in like 15 minutes, like or portraits and and yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he's definitely positioned himself as the master in this image. I think. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, we were supposed to be his breasts in this picture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I forgot that. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's true. But then that's, it kind that, that, of translated, true. and now it, <laughs> I don't know. It looks <laughs> like we're yeah, <laughs> slaves. <laughs> yeah. Did you, uh, Joan? Did, did you learn anything about the way Brecht works, or Brecht? Did you learn anything about the way Joan works by um, do this through this collaboration? Mm, I th <laughs> Yeah. It was it was just fun also just to meet because I knew his work and and uh, also just I mean it's a great festival and the weather is great and uh, I think that was yeah we had some fun but, yeah but I think I, I have learned more before um, we met mm -hmm. here um, I mean copying his comics and, <laughs> and, no, and stop you don't secretly copy and, and my, but, uh, my home so. you also have to imagine this is like 
I mean, this was very, it was very hot, and it was like dust and wind, and, and there was people talking to you while you're painting. It was very, it was kind of stressy also. But uh, yeah, I'm happy that we did it together. Yeah. Um, we have a f just a few minutes uh, left before our time is up. I did want to open uh, up the possibility of anyone asking a question. If anyone has a question, we actually do have a microphone on each side of the room. If you can use that, that's preferable so that everyone can hear you. So we have one person uh, going over there right now and speaking soon. Hi. Um, I, I really like all your work, and uh, I noticed that a lot of you, like, have a sense of humor that I find very funny, but might some closed-minded people it might they might not get it or like they might find it offensive or you know I'm just wondering if you ever had any backlash from that or how you dealt with it or anything like that or any stories about um, that. I mean, yeah, Bendik, we've seen his backlash. <laughs> it's in his <laughs> book uh, in the comments. I mean, yeah. It's, it's, uh, I, I don't know. I, I think I, it, uh, our work is satire, so it's, it's not serious, you know, in that sense. I, again, also, um, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, I don't know. It's, it's satire. Like, it's, it's, I, I don't, when I make a, a drawing or a comic, I don't think about what people will think about it. I try to make a uh, work with the heart in the right place. You know, so, but I think as soon as you make something, you'll get criticism. As soon as you do something, uh, but I don't have any extreme stories or, I mean, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I, I have a lot of messages on, on Facebook um, saying like, like, um, not only, <laughs> I mean, that doesn't I, sound so bad. No, no, no like, like, mm, mm, I like, I don't like your work. No, no. Yeah. I mean, it, it mm, there's a lot of people offended and being uh, so aggressive and like trying to 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 be to the the most politically correct and saying it. it um, and I I I had a lot of messages related to with uh, racism, for example. I I had um, this um, white people or as Asian people. Telling me that I was a, I, I'm a, I am a racist and and not and, and a lot of black people uh, texting like you are the best you are the fucking boss <laughs> and and, uh, and most most of times it's, it's always uh, it's confusing I guess yeah it's it's yeah. so I mean a lot of people it's so boring it's it just it's just they are bored uh, in. <laughs> In they're the bored, you mean? Yeah, yeah they, they have are too much time. They yeah. are bored. Yeah, yeah they yeah, are. That's very true. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't, yeah, it shouldn't be something, I mean, you try to create out of freedom. You know, if you have to already censor yourself, I don't think it's the right way to make art or to make... And, um, I, I'm not, I'm, um, personally, personally, I'm not trying to offend anybody, but... Um, I think it's uh, a bit funny to to have these people telling you what what to do, and and this this is a kind of uh, I like to not to do this, this what they want. So mm. it's so I have uh, this satisfaction about it. It's like mm. great at the end. Yeah, you can get motivation out of it. Yeah, so it's it's true. But somebody's yeah. it just the work is the way it is, and and it's. And and, they, and there's people that doesn't have uh, d don't have humor and people that can understand and and read the comics like yeah. the and then maybe it's uh, just not for them yeah you know? and that's all yeah thank you thank, thank you. you okay and with that please oh, join me in oh, oh yes is there Oh, hey, can I do one? I mean, okay, is, yeah, is it, am I too late? Sorry, someone was just signaling time, but no, go right now, yeah. Okay, uh, so I, I know that you guys come from a published, like book published sort of comic background, but now that I, I mean, it is true that you, you're pulling more success o over online. Do you, when you approach work now, do you um, have a mindset of an, an online illustrator or, or still the um, book illustrator? Um, do you know what I mean? 
I think he's asking because you've had so much success online, but you also work in books. When you're making the work, are you thinking more, is this for the online audience, or are you more motivated by what's going to be good in a book one day? Is that sort of... Yeah, that's yeah, it. Something like that, yeah. I think uh, I, mean, I think you guys use the internet more uh, than I am doing because I I, o I only use it for uh, uh, on Instagram and uh, mm. uh, I mainly focus on like the the books I'm in doing and then I take a picture of it and I'm not I'm not as uh, strategical as you guys. I think. I'm also not so strategical. I I mean I only have a personal <laughs> Facebook page where I post work. I don't have a, a fan page, so I'm not on Instagram. Oh. I'm not on Twitter. <laughs> Uh, so I have a lot of people following me on my personal uh, Facebook, which is not <laughs> strategical, <laughs> smart. Like I can't post anything, or people tag me in horrible pictures, and like I mean, yeah. Um, but uh, I think, y do you mean like the, the difference when you start making a book? Do you think as the book as object or that? Yeah. I yeah. Mean it's, it's different, of course, to make a book. Like uh, I started, posted s some of these first uh, comics first online, and then I thought, and then afterwards only I thought, oh, maybe I should just make a book out of it. Right. So first, it was actually the intention. Also, Shady Bitch was also first the intention to make it online, to make a comic that was only online, uh -huh. and I was not thinking about doing a book. But then, I I love books. You know, I still think it's great to have a physical object of a book in 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 your, um, on your shelves. So, uh, yeah, you, you kind of look for the transi transition from internet to a book. I, I don't know if that answers the question. I mean, um, yeah, roundabout way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anything, uh, Cornella? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, my work is ov is obviously online. It's in and it's. Um, for or an, uh, an online audience, and uh, um, and I think to publish work, uh, my work on on paper, it's the way to get some cash, you know, <laughs> because it, because on Facebook it, it's so great to have the, the your things on Facebook, but then if you if you don't publish your work and, right, yeah. and sell your work and I don't know if if it's if 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 you have another um, you can sell your work in in, a, in another kind of sponsorship. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's, it's the, that the way, but yeah. it, it sounds horrible. <laughs> but uh, this is my. The, it's obviously this romantic um, thing on it that I, I love the uh, to write on paper and and have. Mm, this book, so, but at the same time, it's like I, I, I need to be a professional. So if um, f if you share your work on, I share my work on on Twitter and Facebook and everywhere, but then I need I need money to to survive. It sounds <laughs> terrifying. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Thank you. great. Thank you. And with that, please join me in thanking our panelists for being here today. <laughs> <laughs>